Wait, I need to get my phone for this. Hi-ya! <clears throat> Oh my goodness, hello everybody, welcome to Teal's Roadhouse, back in the man cave, in the house, Shane Prophet. What up? Come on, go, go. It's good to see you, brother. Good to see you again. Oh, we got so much to talk about. First of all, I'm so sorry that you know Derek Barnell. I do. I, I apologize, well. but I'm gonna, he's gonna just have to jump in here, because I think he knows a whole lot about you that I need to know. Lord, <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. How are things in your world, my friend? Man, everything is good. I can't complain. Um... Uh, you know, I've obviously been really busy on the road. Yeah. Uh, I think this year we're going to set at about 190 shows for the year, Woo! which is insane. That's a lot. That's insane. Uh, you know, 17 months ago, I was still cutting grass for a living. And I never in a million years thought I'd get to travel around and do this full time and, you know, make a little bit more than I was back then. Just a little bit. I'm still broke as hell. Nothing's changed there, but... Uh, no, it's, it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. How are you traveling? Yeah. You, uh, sprinter vans. You actually own a bus these days. I, I don't own a bus, uh, yet. Hopefully one day yeah. we're traveling in SUVs, vans, airplanes. What's crazy is, you know, it seems like most of the time right now we're so scattered out. We can't even drive it. Uh, and quite honestly, it's all that an airplane can do to keep up with how much we're traveling right yeah, now. Yeah, and I hate being in the airports. We've been flying a lot this summer, too, and it's just you. We, I mean, if you're going someplace, we've kind of got the rule. If we can, we try to leave the day before because the yep. cancellations are prevalent. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, missed any shows from cancellations this year? I missed um, one, uh, one show that there was just no way. It was actually a private show, so, I mean, it made it a little bit better. Um, it was a private show. Uh, some flights got canceled going out of Memphis. And yeah. We were going to, I think, northern Wisconsin or something like that. And, uh, there and there's no there. easy way to get there. That's Absolutely. like a two layover right there. Yeah, at two, very two or three at, at least. very minimum from, from Memphis. That's probably yeah. a three layover. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that got canceled. And then uh, I actually, for, you know, I've been doing this, like I said, 17 months or so. I had to cancel a couple of shows on my own, which I absolutely hated to do. I had to have emergency surgery on my gallbladder. Really? Yeah. And I was in California when I found that out. And the label flew me home and put me in Vanderbilt. And, uh, yeah, I had to have emergency surgery to get What exactly does the gallbladder do? Does anybody know? I think it's bile or something, Yeah, it's right? like to do with bile. I had to get mine taken out, too. Like, right, it was... I got mine taken out the week before COVID, and um, I had stones, gallstones, and they clogged the duct. But I think you don't need it. I think it's just a bile. Yeah, I think it's one of. I think it's kind of like mosquitoes. They're pointless, you know. <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> I mean, and cockroaches. Yeah, and cockroaches. All, all, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, rats. Yeah, all, exactly. You know, all them. Things. Well, but the thing is, is so I I went to the hospital. Uh, Cause my side was hurting, and I went to the hospital. They did X-rays and everything, and they told me I had a broken rib. So I wasn't going to tell the label because I knew the label wouldn't want me playing shows with a broken rib. But hell, you can't do anything for a broken rib. Yeah. So I was just taking ibuprofen's like they're going out of style, and I wasn't getting any better. No, it was getting worse. Yeah. And I had, I think it was five shows that week, and I got through the fourth show. And I got off stage, and I took my guitar off, and I sat down backstage where I thought nobody could see me. And I just started bawling my eyes out. And my record rep came over there, and she said, hey, what's going on? I hadn't told her that I had a broken rib, supposedly. And my whole side was swollen, and I was, like, pale and everything. And she said, it's more than a rib. This, this isn't a broken rib. So they flew me to Vanderbilt and uh, from California. I mean, the first flight out, they put me in yeah. a in a airplane seat, and I went to Vanderbilt and landed at BNA, and I didn't even know BNA had these. It's a little EMT golf cart, mm -hmm. and they wanted me to lay down on this thing so that they could take me to the hospital. And I was like, "No, my truck's here. I'm not paying for an extra day of parking." <laughs> so I told them, "I said, y'all can follow me to the to the hospital. I can drive myself. I'll be fine." Exactly. Yeah. So we got to Vanderbilt, and they took me in, and uh, they actually Vanderbilt couldn't find anything either. And there was I was back at the ER, and I had this little 
uh, like bed thing out in the hallway because all the rooms were booked. And <clears throat> anyways, there was a surgeon that was walking by and he knew who I was. He was like, hey, man, love your music. And I'm over here in crying pain. I'm like, thanks, you know. And uh, he was like, what's going on? And I told him, and he said, lay down on your side. So I did, and he pressed in one area, and he looked at that nurse that was about to send me home and was like, how did you miss this? And she was like, I, 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 yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, we got to take him in for surgery right now. So they did, and I woke up. They said it was going to be four little bitty holes, four little bitty dots would be all I could see. Well, I woke up. And came to a little bit, and I looked down my gown, and I looked like a piece of sliced lunch meat. <laughs> and doctor came in, and he said, uh, "He said, hey, how you, how you feeling? And I don't remember this, but my girlfriend told me I said this. She, uh, she, got, she said that I was like, well, everything's good, doc, except one thing. He's like, what is it? I said, I got a big old crack in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> But then I asked him, I said, I said, what are all these scars from? You said it was going to be four little dots. And he's, he goes, well, your gallbladder was so swollen. When we got in there, we realized we had to go in there by hand and get it because those we were afraid that it was going to rupture. Yeah. They said your gallbladder is supposed to be the size of a peanut, and mine was the size of a Nerf foam football. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, uh, you ain't passing that. No, hell no. <laughs> so they tried to, they tried, they cut inside my belly button, couldn't get it out. They cut above my belly button, could it, couldn't get it out. And so they had to cut me, like from side to side, and get take it out. Show us the scar. Really. I'm just no, kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> I will. <laughs> That's a lot, man. Yeah. What was the, what was your recovery time? How difficult was that? So they told me, <clears throat> they told me that they didn't want me back out on stage for two weeks, and I was like, "There's just no way." So four days later, I was back out on stage. Yeah. So, well, you got to be careful. You didn't rupture yourself again. Yeah, I know that. that. Well, and they did uh, they did stitches internally. Well, you know, I know you had a marathon scheduled or something. Yeah, right I did. Day. I did actually. <laughs> Boston Marathon was right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Lord. Other than that, man, how's the grind out there? How's your voice hold up? I mean, that's a, that's a lot of work, man. Even when you're young, I mean, it wears you down with, you know, all the different foods and the airlines and the travel and the allergies yeah. and everything. How, how are you holding up vocally? Vocally, everything's, you know, knock on wood, pretty good. Um, but it's just, you know, you know as well as I do, there's a lot of sleepless nights, and that's oh, what yeah. took some getting used some, to. Some of them are self-induced, though. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and it's like, it's like, well, do I make a drink, put me to sleep, or like... Make then, a drink to keep me up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, there's only so much that a Red Bull can do um, and coffee can do, but there's a lot of nights where, you know, you, you only get an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours of sleep, and... That that's what took the most getting used to for me. It wasn't really even being away from home and stuff. I haven't really gotten homesick or anything. I call my parents and stuff on, yeah. on a regular basis. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of times where I'm gone six six out of seven days a week, and that's that that like I said, that really didn't get too crazy, and that wasn't too hard or anything. It was just the sleep because I love to sleep. Yeah, and believe me, I promise you, as you get older, you'll you'll make yourself sleep more because I used to run like that all the time, too. And as you get older, you just can't anymore. But, yeah. you know, a lot of times you get off stage and you're all revved up and you can't go to sleep and you got early morning at a radio station, you got to get up at 530 or whatever the situation is, especially if you're doing a lot of flying, man. It's them early flights and late nights, man. You just, you just don't get any sleep out there. It'll wear you down. Well, and I'll tell you something else that blows my freaking mind. So this happened to me a couple of weeks ago. We had played, um, I forget where it was. We play, I think it was Oregon. We played the Oregon Jamboree, and uh, it was just, it was absolutely insane. I was playing the side stage, but Parker was, Parker McCollum, he was playing the main stage. And for some reason, there was like an eighth mile or a quarter mile in between the two stages. Well, everybody had walked over to the side stage that I was playing on, and it was Hands down, one of the best shows I've ever got to play. Everybody was wound up and just, you know, excited, and I was excited. But anyways, we had came, we were on like a 13-day run, and that was the last show of that run. 
and I was so, so tired. And we had came from Canada. Well, on the flight down from Canada to Oregon, I had fa- finally fallen asleep on this airplane. Well, this flight attendant comes and like starts shaking me and it's like, Would you like a beverage? <laughs> and woke you up. Yeah, I was uh, like, Oh, uh, no, I'm good. Uh, they do that now, I guess. Oh, I guess. But I'm like, no, I don't want the bag of pretzels, you know? Like, I'm good. Just let me catch some Z's. <laughs> wow. You love coming across customs, don't you? Ain't that fun? Man, you know, knock on wood, i tell you what really grinds my gears more than anything is I carry my guitar, okay? And used to, I would check my guitar in a TSA-approved Pelican case until Delta Airlines snapped my guitar in two places. And now I'm like, I'm carrying my guitar on this airplane no matter what, or I'm not flying. So they've got to where now they uh, they they want to check everything, like gate check, mm-hmm. everything, I guess, for whatever reason. And I just, I can't understand, like, you might have 30 open bins on this airplane, but they want you to gate check everything. And I just, I don't understand that for whatever reason why they're more accommodating coming out of nashville because they're used to it but other places just don't understand the relevance yeah. of it and i mean you got you could have a five thousand ten thousand dollar guitar in that case and they want to stick it underneath yeah. and you just never know man they will I, i've watched how those baggage handlers yeah. throw stuff they will tear stuff up but back to the tsa thing you originally asked me about i i kind of went off on a limb there because i got fired <laughs> up but the tsa thing we were talking about so tsa now, especially at BNA, I don't know why they don't have a, like a machine that can read through your guitar case. Now they want to take everything out of all your pouches. They want you to just bare guitar. That's that's what they're going to look at. And then they take your tuners, your cables, your straps, everything, and they look at that, un, undo your straps and everything. And I'm like, what? You know, at all places, why, why at BNA do they not at least have a have a scanner? And then they just wad it up and throw it all back in there. They don't. Care yes, that's what. Yeah, that's what grinds my gears. That's, and there's nothing you can do about it. No, not at all. No, I mean they have you like right there by the short ones. Well, and yeah, and it's. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what's what's crazy is I know these these TSA people. They know my name. I know their name now. Like we're on a first name basis. And it's like, man, you know I ain't got, you you know I ain't got nothing tucked away in that pocket. Like, you can't fit nothing in those guitar pockets on them on them little soft shell cases most of the time. Yeah. Somebody but, ruined it for somebody for everybody. Like, yeah. Somebody did something. Well, I mean, probably more than one. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always the case. It's got yeah. It's all, all it takes is one. They screw it up for everybody. Yeah. It's like I I promise you I don't have a a ten pound brick of cocaine in my guitar case. You know. <laughs> Do you? Are you sure? Well, <laughs> depends on the day, I guess. <laughs> so, t- t- tell me how how did your record deal actually happen? You're on Big Machine, right? Yes, sir. Walk me through uh, how you got to this point because it's so <laughs> different from when I got my deal. So, this is a very crazy story. So, like I said, 17 months ago, Shane cutting grass in the meetings of the road for the city of Columbia, making eleven and a half dollars an hour. I was playing as many gigs as I possibly could on the side. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sometimes Sundays. Uh, most of the bars in Columbia are shut down on Sundays. So most of the time it starts on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And nowhere in my little hometown sells guitar strings. So anytime I need anything to do with music, I have to drive 45 minutes north to Franklin. Yeah. That's the closest guitar center. So I had I – had, you know, several gigs coming up this particular weekend. And uh, I was talking with this girl. We weren't dating yet. We were at the talking phase, as people call it now. And uh, I was trying to be slick and kill two birds with one stone and make a date out of going to get guitar strings. (laughs) So I called this girl up, asked her if she wanted to ride with me, and she agreed to it. I told her I'd take her out to eat. Well, we made that 45-minute ride to Guitar Center. I run in, I get my elixirs, I come back out, hop in the truck. And I asked her what she wanted to eat, and she goes, well, you know, Shane, I really like sushi. And I'm thinking, oh, hell. (laughs) You got to be shitting me, you know? So anyways, 
I wasn't going to be like, no, hell no, let's just go to KFC or anything like that. So I punched in sushi near me on my iPhone, and we go. It was literally the close, closest sushi restaurant to that guitar center. We get there, go to walk in, and Chris Jansen holds the door for me when we went to walk in. Now, here's the deal about that. I'd been to seven concerts my whole life, and to see Chris Jansen was five of those seven. So I immediately knew who it was. And he held the door for me, and I kind of gave him that side eye as I was walking by, you know. Well, we go in, we order our sushi, and, uh, man, I, I this thing I got, it was like a spicy tuna roll. And it was ice cold when I bit into it, and I started gagging a little bit. <laughs> and I wadded it up in my napkin, and I, I was like, well, just eat yours, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm just here hanging out. I'll stop at McDonald's and get me a quarter pounder or whatever on the way home. So I had all this time to think about how I was going to go up to Chris Jansen and, and introduce myself. And <clears throat> so I had it in my mind. I didn't want to go up to him when he was – you know, sitting there with his family eating supper. I was going to wait till he got up. It was one of those places where you get up and go to the cash register when you get ready yeah. to pay. So that's what I had in my mind, and it was picture perfect. Well, so the girl that I'm with actually isn't even done eating her sushi yet, and I see Chris stand up, and I grab my ticket. I had already asked for the ticket. I grabbed the ticket, and I was like, come on, this is my chance. And I get walking across that floor, and he sits right back down in his booth. And I'm, like, halfway committed at this point, and everybody's looking at me like, what the hell is this dude doing, you know? So, anyways, I'm like, well, what? I'm kind of whispering to her. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And she's like, just go for it. So I did. I walk up to his booth, and I sit down, or I kind of kneel down at first. And I'm like, hey, I said, I, I really didn't want to do this, but I'm a huge fan, and you know, I write songs, and it would mean the world to me if you would listen to some of the music I'd been writing. And he just kind of looked at me. You know, I caught him off guard. He just kind of looked at me for a second, and his wife that was sitting right beside him spoke up, and she goes, Hey, I'm Kelly. I'm Chris's wife. I'm also his manager, and I'm also a music publisher. Is that a receipt you're holding in your hand? I write my email down on it. You could send us some songs, and you have our word. We'll listen to them. <clears throat> well, because my mama raised me right, I go, Yes, ma'am. That'd be great. Thank you. And Chris looked up at me, and he said, you just say yes, ma'am? I said, yes, sir. He said, I like that a lot. Pull up a chair and talk to me. So I did. And we sat there, and we talked about hunting and fishing and writing songs and God and country music and anything you can imagine, we talked about it. And <clears throat> I got up. You know, we said our goodbyes, and I thanked him for, you know, talking with me and stuff. And I went and paid, and I got out to the truck. And as soon as I got in the truck, I got that receipt out that she had wrote her email on, and I had sent probably, I think it was three or four of the best songs that I thought I'd written at the time. And at the bottom, I said, if you ever need anything, just give me a call. And I wrote my phone number down. Fast forward two weeks later, I'm weed-eating in a ditch in Columbia, Tennessee on a Wednesday morning, and my I feel my phone ringing in my pocket, and I pull it out, the caller ID says, Jansen. And I answer it. I said, hello. He said, hey, this is Chris. What are you doing? I said, well, it's a Wednesday morning. Like most people, I'm at work. What you got going on, bud? He goes, well, he said, I listened to them songs you sent. He said, I uh, I want you to come out on tour with me. Go put your two-week notice in. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's literally, I mean, so he offered me a publishing deal then, too. And uh, I was still working, you know, I still had two weeks left. And during that two weeks, uh, he called me, it was a couple of days later, uh, he called me, I was running a bush hog on a tractor and he said, Hey, I have this song idea called real bass pro. And I know you're a big outdoorsman. I want you to be a writer on it. So I didn't have my guitar or anything. So I downloaded this guitar app on my phone and I could press, it was like, you would press the D, the G, the E, the C, all that. And it would fake strum this little guitar on this guitar app. <clears throat> and so I'm sitting here pressing all these buttons. I have my phone in one hand. I'm driving this bush hog in the other. And uh, I asked him, I said, can we can we ride it over my lunch? And he said, yeah, that's fine. So during my lunch break, I found a little hidden spot underneath a shade tree, and I sat there, and I, was, I, I had a couple hours to think about this song, and 
I had this course that I'd written down to this idea he had, Real Bass Pro. And, it, you know, during my lunch break, I parked underneath that shade tree. M me and him and Mitch Oglesby, another songwriter, we got on a three-way FaceTime, and I read him that course, and Chris said, that's the course I want. So sure enough, we 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 touched up a few things on it, and uh, we ended up writing, you know, the bridge and the verses and everything. So that's that that was my first major label cut. And uh, out on that tour, uh, the night that we played the Ryman Auditorium is actually when I got my record deal. Scott Borchetta was sitting in the crowd, and I'd had a meeting with him the day before, and <clears throat> he had asked, you know, if he could come to the to the Ryman show. And I was like, yeah. They gave me four comp tickets, one for my mom, one for my dad, two for Scott Borchetta. So I thought the meeting the day before it went pretty good, but he wanted to see me live. And on on that tour, on Chris's Halfway to Crazy tour, I was just opening just me and my guitar. Yeah. And I'd go out 30, 45 minutes a night and just try to, he told me just try to wow him. He wanted to see what I had. So I was like, okay. So, <clears throat> anyways, the night of the rhyming, I'm uh, I'm up on stage, and Chris had told me, he said, hey, he said, I know uh, you're only scheduled to have like 25, 30 minutes, but take as long as you need. I said, all right, thank you. So I think I ended up playing about 45 or 50 that night, and every time I'd look out in the crowd, I couldn't look towards my mom or Scott Borchetta because my mom was sobbing the whole time, and I see her wiping away tears. She's crying, and... She had no idea who she was sitting right next to. I didn't tell them I had a meeting with a record label because I didn't want them to get their hopes up or anything. So, anyways, I played uh, that night at the Ryman for like 50 minutes. I got two standing ovations, just me and my guitar. And whenever I went to walk backstage, Scott Borchetta and Julian Raymond, he's my A&R guy now. I saw Julian first, and he was carrying this pretty guitar case and I was like what in the world is that and he he came up to me and he said hey he said no matter what happens we want you to have this and he handed me that guitar case and he said I saw you've been playing the same guitar since you first started and he said I don't know if you have another one or not but we want you to have this it was a brand new SJ 200 in a custom color wow that they only made two of, supposedly. I have one, and Bruce Springsteen has the other. Wow. But then Scott stepped up, Mr. Borchetta, and he stuck his hand out, and he said, Shane, welcome to the machine team. And literally three days later, I signed the contract. That's freaking awesome, man. <laughs> it really is. You know, coming from a small town and, and a kid that's grown up working your tail off, man, dream of the dream, to see it actually start working, it's so much, sometimes it's overwhelming, isn't it? It is. I mean, just, I mean, there's times you lay down, you close your eyes at night, and, I mean, I remember when when I got my record deal and things started rolling, I bought my place and all this. I had this old beat-up car that's still out there in the pasture, and I would come in off the road, and I'd just go sit out there and cry. <laughs> You know, you just get overwhelmed yeah. by all of it because because it's life changing stuff that that you know you dream it for so long, and when all these things things start happening, it's just wow. Sometimes you just can't hardly believe it all. Man, you know, I'm very I, I'm a firm believer that there's a difference in a house and a home. Yeah, and I'm very blessed to say my my parents they brought me up in a home instead of a house, and I could tell both my parents that I wanted to be an astronaut when I get home today. And they would watch a spaceship take off tomorrow. And number one, I wouldn't be here without that support system at home. Yeah. And like like you're talking about, man, my parents, my mom's only ever been to seven states. I've been to 48 in the last six months. And, you know, you. I was talking about the, a lot of sleepless nights and stuff. And you think about that, I'll be laying in a hotel bed. Number one, I had never stayed in no hotels, no whole lot. When when I did, I stayed at the Super 8. Yeah. Okay. Now we're staying at Four Seasons. We're staying at, you know, nice stuff. And, you, yeah, you might only get an hour and a half of sleep a night. But you can bet whenever that alarm clock goes off at 3 a.m. or 3.30 or 4, whatever time it is, 
I'm going to lay there. This happens a lot, actually. I'm glad you said that because you look back at how, how far you've come in the last, you know, year for me, last – just think about how far you've come in the last 10 years. Oh, my gosh. You know? Yeah. And you you you, you kind of sit back and you think, man, I'm only getting an hour of sleep tonight. This sucks. And then you look at the bigger picture and you're like, it's like so bad at all, man. No, I could still be weed eating in the ditch. That's exactly and, right. And the, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of people. I've got some good friends that have landscape companies that work hard that are just good, honest, God-fearing people. But when you dream a dream and you get a chance to live it, even if you just get a taste of it, man, for every one of us that get a chance to taste and experience a little bit of the thousands of people that dream it that never get a chance. Yeah. So it's real special to me. It it absolutely is. And, like, the, the night of the rhyming, I knew I had a record deal that night. I hadn't signed the contract, but, you know, I, I I felt like I had a pretty good shot at getting a record deal. Scott had just told me, welcome to the machine team. So as soon as, as soon as you know, I, I met with them and we talked and everything, the night after I played the rhyme and all the – I was riding Chris's bus and everything, and the bus was parked out there. And after he got off stage, me and his guys went out to Broadway – and, you know, you think Broadway's going to be, oh, man, we're going to get hammered. We're going to have a hell of a time. And, yeah, there is people doing that. But for me, that was my first time ever stepping foot on Broadway. And I walked around. We started off at Tootsie's. And we started off at the bottom, went to the top. And then we just walked around all those honky-tonks. Everybody was drunk and having a good time. And I was crying like a baby. Because I knew I was getting to live the dream that all of those people that are playing those long shifts on Broadway, I'm getting to live that out. And chances are, most of those people won't ever get that opportunity. You're right. That's the truth. And that's that's sad, you know, if you think about that. But you you got to look at the uh, the business side of the whole thing too. What are we playing? Eighteen currents. So you got all these labels with all these artists that are stacked upon these labels. You're competing for songs. You're competing for space, you know. And and when there's only, you know, so many current songs being added to a playlist, you know how difficult it is to get into that system and, oh, yeah. and, and be a part of that? It's not an easy thing to do. Because you're competing against Luke Combs and Luke Bryan and Jason Aldean and, you know. But Mar not Marin Morris anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that in there. <laughs> Let's educate Derek. Yeah, I, I, I don't follow. Maren, Maren Morris just do. said that she is uh, uh, is retiring from country music. She's not something to the effect that uh, um, that uh, the industry was extremely misogynistic and that she just didn't want to be a part of it anymore, so she's going to another format. I hope it's rap because it's very much more misogynistic over there. So I'm just letting you know. Just didn't, saying. real quick, sorry, this is important. <laughs> didn't she say something like she tried to fix country music, and but it was already burning itself to the ground or something to that extent? Bold point. God bless her. <laughs> bless your heart. Bless your heart. <laughs> I'll say this. I'll say this. So the thing I love that's so just amazing about country music versus I feel like other genres is I I don't really see other genres sitting. I mean, I would say me and you are friends, and but in a way we're kind of competition in a way. We're almost. peers. Exactly. We're peers. Exactly. I don't see another genre where two people are sitting down having a having a cool conversation like this. No, the competition is so fierce. I've been to the AMA Awards, uh, the American Music Awards. Let me tell you, the backstage at those pop awards is nothing like what it is at the ACMs or the CMAs. Those people hate each other. And when they come, yeah. they bring an entourage of 20, 30 people, and they could all have a brawl backstage at any time. It's, it's, it's vicious. They literally despise each other. It's, yeah. it's, it's real. Yeah, and I, you know, even in the '90s when I was, you know, releasing records for radio and playing the chart game, 
we were all friends for the most part. You know, you have your little disagreements, but for the most part, we were all happy when each other had success. It was just a great time, you know, and, and I'm glad to know that that still exists in country to a large degree. I know there's yeah. friction in certain areas, but overall, I think people that are in it are real appreciative of just the overall health of the format and want everybody to do good and, and, and appreciate the, the, the love of the craft of peer to peer. Yeah. And, and, you know, playing all these radio shows that I'm doing right now, you know, I'm, I'm hanging out with a lot of these up and comers that are in the same shoes I'm in. Yep. And, you know, we'll, you know, it's just, it's, it's really refreshing because don't get me wrong. You might have one bad apple out of a hundred in this, oh, yeah. in this business. And I don't know, have you heard, uh, the saying, uh, don't meet your heroes? I have. Uh, I've Do you agree with that or not? You know, I've experienced both sides of it. Uh, there, there have been times that I've met people that, uh, you know, I love Hank Jr. to death, but he terrifies me. <laughs> I've seen him do some things at different times that, that made me terrified to be around him. Um, I got to spend, you know, everybody was always scared of George Jones. I spent two years on the road with George Jones, and he was the greatest person to me. I learned so much from yeah. him. Uh I I got I got to spend some time with Haggard over the years, you know. So how was I mean, that? You know, I got to go to Haggard's house when me and Mark Chestnut and Diffie were touring together, and me and Joe actually went out to Haggard's house and spent the day with him, and he was so gracious to us, man. He was really cool, uh, and obviously he was he was one of the biggest influences on me that I ever had. I mean, he was him and him and Straight were like the two guys from early on. Most of the people that I've met. Man, I've, I've been blessed. But that's in the country music world. You get outside and you meet actors and different people. That's that's a whole different thing out yeah. there. Yeah. I, and that's why I ask because I agree. I feel like it can be hit or miss being yep. your heroes. And sometimes it's a timing thing, too. You might just catch them on a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that that's yeah. also very true. Yep. There is people that have bad days, you know. And, I, you know, you might wake up, you might have a headache one day, and you might wake up the next and wake up next to a – 10 out of 10, and you're like, man, life is good, you know? <laughs> so where where are you at in the album process? You, you've you got an album, you got a single out right now? Uh, it's it, You're well, working a single right yeah, now. Do you get no, it? We're, we're actually not anymore, technically. Yeah, okay. Uh, we will have another one out to radio here very shortly. So do you have an EP cut? I, yeah, so I have a I have an EP. Um it's called uh, Murray County Line. It's out. And then I actually just released another song uh, outside of that called Still Picks Up. Cool. Um, and it's uh, – the thing is, is I know you're a songwriter as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm my thing is, is <clears throat> I'm not to say at all that I wouldn't cut outside songs one day. But for me, I'm very passionate about being a songwriter because I'm not, I'm not really – I'm not really one to necessarily talk about my feelings, you know? And so I've kind of used songwriting as therapy in a way. Yeah. Because I, I like to write about how I'm feeling versus just talking about it. And this uh, <clears throat> this song that we just released, the most recent song, still picks up. Um, it's, uh, it's about, you know, <clears throat> me and my dad, we were on a hunting trip in eastern Kentucky, and he had a massive stroke on a mountainside. And we were, you know, 30 minutes from the truck and an hour away from the hospital once we got to the truck. And I was terrified. And I put my bow down. Whenever I found him, I put my bow down, and I tried packing him over my shoulder. And I won't ever forget what he, what he said to me. He said, put me down. You're going to get us both hurt. And I looked at his face, and the whole left side of his face was not moving. I had no cell phone service to call 911 or anything like that. I was 20 minutes from having any cell phone service. And I got him off that mountain finally with my tree stand, my bow, and everything up there. And got him to the truck, put him in the passenger seat, and just took off. And I didn't know which way the hospital was, honest to God. I didn't know which way. But it, there was a I, – I knew I had a 50 – 50% chance because I could either go left or I could go right. Whenever we pulled out of that holler and I went right. And then from there, literally, I, I, I knew where I was once I took that right. It was just in that moment I was so kind of shook up. I didn't really yeah. know where to go. But anyway, I got into the hospital and 
um, whenever we did get into service, I called ahead and I told him, hey, I'm bringing him. He He's had a heart attack or a stroke or something. Y'all need to be ready to take him because it was just a little bitty ass hospital. And uh, I waited in that waiting room and honestly, I didn't know if I was going to get to see him again or not. And in that moment, you know, you don't really, when you don't know if you're going to see somebody again or not, especially somebody like your best friend, like your dad, uh, me and my dad are best friends. And I, uh, I got to thinking about maybe some past fights and past arguments and stuff that could have been avoided. And, uh, I had that idea and I wrote it down on the notes on my phone and we ended up writing it, uh, probably about eight months ago and we released it a few months ago. Man, songs like that, I've always, I, I like what you said about it being therapeutic. I've always felt like when, when I'm in songwriter mode and I'm really drawing from, because I don't write all year round. I mean, I usually put a lot of song ideas back and, and wait till I kind of push some other things aside and get into it. But it's, I've, I've purged so much stuff that, I, that you can just kind of bottle up and you don't realize you're bottling it all up. It's songwriting. That's why I like collaborating so much because when you're sitting in a room with a couple of people, one or two people that you trust, that you've got a relationship with, you share things. It's 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 yeah. a different experience. I mean, a lot of people don't really, how do you write a song? How do you do this? So much of it's about the chemistry of the people that you get in the room with because you might sit there for an hour and nobody say a word. Yeah, I've been, I've been to writes like that 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 seem to grind on, and then all of a sudden somebody will just go, and then it's just all there. Yeah, but just the collaboration and the sharing of ideas and talking about you know a painful situation that happened. I mean, it's all at all, man. Being able to talk all that stuff out in that environment's always been very healthy for me. I'm glad that you appreciate it like that. I absolutely do. And uh, Derek back here, he actually heard part of a song that I'd started writing a couple of weeks ago. We went to the river uh, a couple of weeks ago. You don't Dude. kayak, do you? I don't kayak. <laughs> I don't kayak. <laughs> you heard a Titanic, haven't you? <laughs> that river trip he's talking about, that was a couple uh, weeks ago. And then we were out there, you know, of course, drinking a little bit. And no. I didn't put any sunscreen on that day like an idiot. Just Usually I'm, I'm a little more tan than I am by this point in the year because I'm usually kayaking, but we've been so busy I hadn't been out there. So I didn't I didn't use any sunscreen. Dude, that next day I was so violently sunburnt that my eyes were swollen. Bless you. And then we had to fly that next day. That's what it was. We had to fly, and uh, I walked through the airport with a backpack. So that was that hurt. outstanding. Yeah. It. It Dude, it hurt to put my guitar on. <laughs> it did. But So uh, how did y'all meet? How did y'all uh, – Mutual friend of ours, yeah. Troy, Troy Anderson okay, from Columbia, and uh, his daddy, T.W., down there on the Tennessee River. Uh, I met Troy randomly at a, at a fire pit, just like I met Shane, and uh, Troy said he had a, a friend of his from Columbia that plays and sings and wondered if I'd want to jam with him. I'm like, hell yeah, dude, I'll jam with anybody. So Shane comes down, and dude, as soon as he opened his mouth singing, I was like, holy shit. So <laughs> it's just kind of, there were about 10 people around right when we started playing, and I didn't look up probably 45 minutes because I was just, I was having a blast, man. The next thing I know, I look up and there's like 70 people standing around. Wow. This little campground there. It was awesome. That's it cool. So I, I've, I've had a chance to hang out in the Columbia a few times. We've actually uh, kayaked the Duck River a bunch down there. I love that area. Oh, yeah. And uh, Blair Garner's been a friend of mine for over 20 years. I know he's uh, the Mule House went under. But I, we got to play that the first year that it opened. Well, they're back open. Are they back open? Did, yeah. they, did somebody else buy them out, or did Blair open it back up? I think Blair opened it back I, I was just there. Uh, when was it? It was a couple of nights ago. They yeah. had uh, Ella Langley there. And uh, stopped by and saw them. I actually saw Blair last night. That's good. I'm glad to know because I, I I know he put a lot of money into it. It's just a little bit of a drive. Where the attendance still good down there? People coming? Oh, yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. So I got to um, – I actually played the first ever show there, opening up for John Langston. No kidding. And that was the first show that I played there. Uh, a couple months ago, I guess it was back in April, I think. Um yeah, April, that's Mule Day. Um, they had a back parking lot party. They were advertising this parking lot party. It was me and Chris Jansen, and we got to go. It was my hometown show, and I think they said there was like eight to 9,000 people, and uh, it was just insane. 
it was it was very very fun. So I'm trying to remember why did they call it, what what was the mules? What was the mule symbolism? That the mascot mules a mix between a horse and a donkey. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> It's like she was, Lindsay asked some, uh, earlier, what's the difference between a small mouth bass and a large mouth bass? A large mouth has a bigger mouth. It shouldn't be that easy. It shouldn't be that easy. <laughs> hey, you know what's crazy, though, is I would rather catch a small mouth than a large mouth. All day. I mean. They fight harder. They do. They do. They do. They don't get as big, but they fight hard, man, and they hit hard. Yeah. Yeah. I got a question for you since we're talking about animals and stuff. I was scrolling through your pictures here. Tracy, look at this damn frog. I like frogs. Look at that son. Holy shit. <laughs> That's a big bullfrog. That's, that's good eating frog right there. All right. I like frog legs. All right. So mm -hmm. this is very, very redneck. Okay. There you go. So whenever I got my record deal, one of the first things I did was I joined the country club in Columbia. And you have to be a member to golf out there. And I knew it would, you know, it would be good because who doesn't golf in the music industry? Everybody you know? golfs. You got to golf. So. Even if you suck at it. Yeah, exactly. So. What I do is I'll have my golf clubs on one side of the cart, and I'll have a fishing pole and my frog gig on the other. I gig that frog at my country club. Wow. That's a huge frog. If there's one, there's ten of them. Yeah. At least. Oh, yeah. I got to – I got to – so I put all my frogs in a tube sock. <laughs> like I'll stretch out a – no, seriously. I, I'll stretch out a – <laughs> Huh? How many frogs do you have? I mean, you'll gig. When you, can't, when you gig them. Oh, yeah. oh. No, he's on, hat, it, drops them. In, drops them in a sock so they don't hop off. This man is redneck. <laughs> he's got pet frogs. Did you break it? I don't know if I did or not. He's like, you were like, I'm so like redneck or something that I joined a country club or, or something like that. And you're telling that story. And I'm thinking, one of the last podcasts, Tracy was talking about how he had like all this meat in his fridge back in the day. And he was like, you know, squirrels. And I was like, rabbits, frog yes. legs. Yes. Alaskan salmon. You don't, have you ever had squirrel? You don't, can't say I have. <laughs> All right. We're going to have to have a squirrel mulligan. How do you, how do you, <laughs> how do you, how do you like to eat squirrel? I always like to put it in a tomato based stew with potatoes and stuff. Wow. Like, and, and because then it, it's getting real tender. But I don't mind fried squirrel either. I mean, it's like a little bit of chicken, like a tree chicken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you I, mean, do I don't, like medium. Like, huh? it's not beef, so it's not like you cook it. It'll be a little tougher because they're obviously, they're climbing stuff. They have they have little tougher muscles, but okay. squirrel's fine to eat. So is tur so is turkey and rabbit. And I mean, not, and frog legs are great. You just got to be careful with frog legs. You got to cut that little tendon in there. When you get to frying them in the pan, they'll hop out. Yeah, they'll hop out on they'll you. They'll hop out. The leg will jump on you. Yeah. You don't cut that tendon in that Wait, y'all don't kill it first? You cut the legs off of it. You don't kill the rest of the frog, though. <laughs> Just let it drag itself oh. on with the front leg. Oh my God. <laughs> He's in like a little baby wheelchair. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I have I found I got a little two men boat in old pond back here. When I I hadn't frog gigging a long time, but I got a, had a little twenty two rifle and I'd put shorts in it and I'd take me a dip net and when I go out there by myself instead of having to get up close to it, I put me a headlamp on and I could pop them with that short. And it doesn't it doesn't tear them up, right? Just dip them out, and the prongs the way we gig back <laughs> home, you know, gigging is like a it's a three prong spear, right? We had them some some old boy built them back home that had a trigger, so they would clamp up, and you'd set it open, and when the frog would hit, it close on them. Yeah, it had a trigger clamp in the middle. You can't find those around here. I hadn't been able to find them around here. I mean, you ain't gonna find that at Academy or Bass Pro Shop no, as far as a gig. Lord, no, no, you might have to do some redneck ingenuity or something. But it's so cool because it had a little pressure pad to just and it clamp on them. No, I know what you're talking about. Bottom. Yeah, it's just, you ever yo-yo fish? You ever done? You know what a yo-yo is? I know what a yo-yo is. Like a limb line. When I first came up here, we, me and my buddy Brian used to fish on the river all the time. And back home, they make these things called yo-yos. They're little metal things, and you have a, a hang line. You tie it in a tree, and it's spring-loaded. So you pull your line down, you set your hook in it, it has a little trigger. And you set the hook down in the water, so you hang them all around your coves and stuff. When the fish bites it, it sets the freaking hook on them. And then like a catfish will just hang there so you could go in the cove at night and you sit there with your spotlight and they're metal so they just flash. You could tell if it's flashing that you got a fish on the yo-yo. 
I'll be doing. Bad to the bone, keep your five gallon bucket full of those, son. Hey, <laughs> Tracy, can you get those at Walmart? No, you have to order them off the of dark web. <laughs> what about snapping turtle? You like snapping turtle? I've never eaten snapping turtle. I know I've eaten turtle and conch and stuff at islands, but I've never had snapping turtle. You know how to clean a snapping turtle? Mm-mm. Is this a joke? No. Oh, okay. I was trying to. How, how would you say is the best way to clean a snapping turtle? Just guessing. Uh, I would say you probably kill it first to cut the head off of whatever, and you open it up from the bottom. And then, uh, I mean, I've, I guess it's all white meat, too. You probably have to skin it out. All right. So turtles, snapping turtles. What I like to do is I'll get a barrel, and I'll put clean water in it, let them waller in that for a few days. Cleans them out. Like purging a shrimp or exactly. crawfish or something. Like okay. purging crawfish. So a snapping turtle, he's going to stick his head out when he goes to bite down on something. Mm-hmm. So you get something, stick his head out. Boom, hatch it to the dome, you know, chop that head right off. Well, so you have all this neck skin, right? So you get your water hose, turn it off, stick that water hose in that neck and clamp down as hard as you can. Do not let any of that water come out. Turn all your water on as high pressure as it'll go, and that turtle will start swelling up on the inside. It'll pop that pop shell, that shell and it comes dying. right off. I'll be dying. Well, you learn something new every day. I just take a hammer to it. No. Because then you get turtle shell in your meat. Uh, hmm. <laughs> That's like Seems cracking so obvious egg. Now. Yeah. Wow. I was an idiot. See, I've learned something new. I never knew that. Yeah. Have you ever had rattlesnake? I haven't had rattlesnake. I've heard that it's good. It's a little rubbery. So uh, they used to do this thing down at Freer, Texas, called the Rattlesnake Roundup every year. And I've played it two or three times over the years. But they literally go out and they have pits full of rattlesnakes. They go out and they collect all of them. They have exhibitions mm. and stuff. But you can eat fried rattlesnake down there. I don't particularly care for it. If I was hungry, if I'm hungry and I, I, I'll eat just damn near anything. I mean, I don't have yeah. a problem with it. But, uh, I mean, it's it's just a little different. But I've tried all kinds of weird stuff over the over the years. Down in Fort Worth, we had uh, it was rattlesnake and rabbit sausage. I can't remember the name of the place. It's one of those nicer ones. But uh, ra- rattlesnake and rabbit like a nice sausage. Place. And, then, well, I, and then they had kangaroo, too. Sounds man. like a fine establishment. I ate a kangaroo, and it was alley? awesome. They probably had some emu, too, didn't they? Well, if, if we think of I'll look at shit up. I can see what <laughs> he can't stand it. Can't stand it. Uh, have you ever had a? Arm- Is this are we playing? Have you ever? Yes. Have <laughs> never have you ever? Have you ever had an armadillo? No, I've never eaten armadillo, and I've never eaten possum either. They say possum or raccoon and possum is real greasy. You never had a coon? Never ate a coon. Put them in a crock pot, put some sweet baby rays on them. My wife would kill me if I brought that in the house. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> coon- sweet baby rays goes good on everything. So you know, you said something about an armadillo. I uh, we ought to have a gathering out here and see who can cook the wildest wild dish. Yeah, <laughs> lonesome <laughs> day. Uh, armadillo got me banned from Walmart for two Tell years. Tell me all about that. I've been meaning to ask about why you got banned from Walmart. <laughs> I've heard. I thought that's why you just brought it up. Well, I mean, I, it was a segue. She's leading. She's leading okay. the witness. Right. She is. <laughs> so I was I was fourteen or fifteen, and uh, well, you I'll, can't be held accountable for that. Exactly. Yeah. That's what that's what kept me from getting into a lot of trouble. So I always hung out with older kids that could drive. The whole time I couldn't, I always hung out with older kids that could drive. So my my parents, they really liked these boys I was hanging out with. But anyway, what what you do in a small town on a Friday night when there's nothing to do, nobody's having a party, is you ride back roads. Yep. So we were riding back roads and we hit this armadillo. Didn't mean to, honest to God, we didn't mean to. But I'm like, put it in reverse. So I remember the headlights shining on this armadillo. And this thing, it's just, it's got like one leg broke. And it's sitting there doing circles. And it don't know what to do. Well, we had this empty cooler in the back of the truck. And I grabbed this cooler and I go over there and I kick this armadillo in this cooler. And I'm like, how many people do you know with a pet armadillo? None. So I had this old old fish tank at my house that I was going to let this armadillo live in. Big fish tank, probably about the size of this table. And <clears throat> so, anyways, I had it in my mind that I would just put him in this in this aquarium when I got home, and I'd build him a little habitat in there and all this and feed him grubs and whatever he wanted. So, 
Anyways, in between where we hit this thing in my house, one of the boys in this truck had talked me into taking this thing inside of Walmart and letting it run loose. Sounds like a great idea. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So mm. we get to Walmart, and I have it in this little – it's it's one of those coolers that's like triangular. Yeah, with has, the handle on the top. With the handle on the top, and you press the button. And, mm. and Yep. Yep. No them well. Yep. <laughs> so – one of the one of the boys we have a we have a driver, we have a person taking a video, and then we have me that's gonna do the the thing. So you remember those red box movie centers? Yep. So I had a buddy over there. He had his phone in his shirt pocket taking a video of this. I walk in. I'm carrying this cooler. It looked really suspicious. I open up this cooler, and I'm in the lobby where all the claw machines and stuff are. I open up this cooler and I dump this thing out, and I didn't think about poking holes in this cooler. That damn thing suffocated, <gasps> and he's deader than a doornail. Oh, and he out, probably had internal injuries too. Well, yeah. <laughs> that could you be. Know, you yeah. ran over him. That could be it. But too. you weren't driving, so Peter can't blame you. Exactly. Yeah. So hell, I was trying to save the damn thing. It's suffocated. But I guess it's <laughs> suffocated, or <laughs> like you said, I didn't really think about that. But anyway. This thing lands directly on its shell, and it's sitting there, legs up, with blood just coming out of its mouth. And I sit there for a second, and I look at it, and I look at the camera that's videoing me, and I close that cooler up, and I just walk right back out to the truck, and we leave. <laughs> well, we go home, and I think we watched a movie or something. We played pool, I think. And uh, it gets to be about 1 a.m., and that was probably about 11. It gets to be about 1, and I told my parents, I said, hey, I think we're going to go to Waffle House. I want me some hash browns. So my mom gave me 20 bucks, and I was only like 14. She gave me 20 bucks. And uh, we we left, and I said, boys, we got to go see if that armadillo is still there. So we rode by the crime scene, and as soon as we pulled into that Walmart parking lot, three cop cars Swarm that truck. You never return to the scene of the crime, Shane. In the same truck. <laughs> Just don't in do the it. same truck. And and you know, it 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 would have been different if it was like a black Chevrolet. This thing was one of those Honda trucks that you don't ever see out on the road. There's only one in the whole county. Yes. There's only <laughs> there's only one in the whole county and we're in it. So uh the cops told us to go in there and sit down and I'm sitting there on one of them electric scooters or talking to us and uh they're like, why in the hell would you think it's okay to come in here and throw a possum in the lobby of Walmart? <laughs> and I, I'm listening to this cop, and he keeps calling it a possum. And I, I'm like, sir, it's and armadillo, he, sir. Yeah, he keeps he keeps like ignoring me, and I keep going, sir, sir, and he's getting madder by the second. He finally goes, what? I said, it wasn't a possum. And he goes, are you trying to be funny? I said, no, sir, it was Armadillo. And he his hand just flew off. He started cussing, and, I mean, he got, he was fired up. <laughs> but I ended up getting banned for two years. My mom, uh, <laughs> my mom made me write a letter of apology to uh, the cops and oh. the manager of Walmart. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. That's about the only grocery store in columbia too other than the people well, at least your mom couldn't tell you to go to the store <laughs> exactly exactly can't do it mom exactly. <laughs> i'm on i'm on parole yeah. <laughs> i'm on walmart <laughs> well hell they they took so i was a i was a minor did they put your picture up and say do not let this man in the store oh, so they couldn't mind this is no shit they took pictures of the two guys that i was with and they did get their pictures and had them up on a bulletin board or something i guess but where I was a minor, they weren't allowed to take my picture. Isn't so did something? you go in? Like, I mean, like, I know you were banned, but, like, did you go in? Well, I'm not banned anymore, so I guess I can say. <laughs> so my mom made me write a letter of apology. Well, she knew who this manager was, like, apparently. Because she, she found his name and made me include his name on this letter of apology. Well, she's in there, like, a year, year and a half later. So I had like six, eight months left of parole, if you want to call it that. Well, she's in there. She's 
trying to find her a hamburger's meat or something, you know, hamburger chub, I don't know. And uh Armadillo ground chub. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she's in there and she sees this manager that had banned me. And she said, Hey, she said, I'm so sorry about my delinquent son, you know, he he's the one that threw the armadillo in here. And uh, I, she said, he, he wrote you a letter of apology, and, you know, I just want you to know how sorry we are. He goes, did you not get that letter I sent back? She goes, no. He said, I told him he could come back since he wrote me that letter. He told me I could come back, so I was only banned for like a month. <laughs> But you didn't tell your mom. Well, I didn't know that. Did you not intercept the letter? No, I never got the letter. I never got the letter. Yeah. But, I mean, like, seriously, the Walmart, hell, I couldn't even go to, you know, when you're 15, everybody parks their truck at the Walmart, and you put your tailgates down, you hang Oh, yeah. Got the cops come run you off. That's exactly right. And then you go to the big lots (laughs) or the Kmart. We went to the gravel pit and the rice fields and the farmland. That's what we did. Yeah. You yeah. grew up in Arkansas, right? Yeah. Farmland, man. Nothing down there. Yep. 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 A little bit of town. What part of Arkansas? The very furthermost southwest corner of the state bordered uh, Oklahoma to the west and Texas to the south. Last little crappy town right there in the corner of the wow. state. Wow. Yep. Wow. Not much there. A lot of farmland. Rice and soybeans and cotton and all that stuff. Down yeah. There. Yeah. Yep. Did you grow up duck hunting? Never have duck hunted in my life. I've hunted everything else, pheasant and quail and dove. You have any desire to? Not really. Okay. And I've got a lot of friends that do it, man. And You know, Stuttgart, Arkansas is one of the best duck hunting places in the entire United States. <laughs> I feel like yeah. he was about to invite you. I was, but <laughs> if you don't have a desire to, it's okay. I, I'll yeah, go in this place. It's too damn cold. I don't like getting in cold water <laughs> in the cold winter waiting on a damn duck that I really don't even like duck meat that much. <laughs> Are you serious? I don't like it. Have I've you ever had, had teal? I have not. I've had uh, – Tracy Bird has fixed some duck uh, gumbo before that I like, but as far as duck meat, I don't, it's too gamey. It's too wild for me, too dark meat. Speaking of that, I had deer meat the other night. It was from a 11-pointer I killed this past year. And I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard from multiple people if you shoot a deer, if you shoot a buck during the rut, and he has all that testosterone in his system that the meat will taste like shit. I will vouch for that now. That was the most god-awful piece of meat I've ever put in my... Well, that sounds terrible. That was the worst steak I've ever had in my life. I had it the other night. So I cut the I cut the back strap into like two-inch pieces and wrapped it in bacon. Yeah. Just like a filet mignon, you know? Put it in dales and everything and... It it tasted like an old rutten buck smells. Probably like a like a mule deer. You can't eat mule deer either. Some of that that's so gamey, really? man. Mule deer is not good either. What about lamb? Uh, I've had some lamb. Lamb. You like good. it? I like lamb. So I had lamb at this. It was a place in Nashville called uh, Texas Brazil or something. Oh yeah, yep. Texas yep. Brazil. It's. I don't think it's there anymore. It's on Second Ave, I believe. Is it, is that over by a college or something? No, Second Avenue. It was yeah. I thought it was there. I th- yeah, because I've been to it's. It's really good. Well, really I got a. You know, they come around. That's where they come and carve. Yeah, just yeah big hunk you have yeah. you have like a green light, yeah. red light. You know, green light. Which bring it to up, me. Yeah. yeah. So I just left it on green the whole damn time. <laughs> <laughs> well, they come around. They're like, "Would you like a piece of Lego lamb?" I'm like, hell yeah! I ain't never tried this. So they cut me off a piece and I put it. I, I get to gnaw it on it, and. It tasted like an old billy goat smell. <laughs> I You're pretty particular it. about your meat, ain't you? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> What's your favorite cut of meat from a cow? This sounds really, really bougie, okay? But, I like bougie. So I called the butcher on the way here, and he has me some tomahawk ribeyes. So. Oh, son. See, that's what I'm talking. And I like regular beef. I've had Wagyu and all that stuff. Mm. I like the marbling of a regular old ribeye steak. That's yep. what I like. I agree. There's nothing beats that to me. Well, and some, you know, sometimes I'm in a mood where I want I want that fat of a ribeye, and then there's sometimes where I want like a New York strip. Just give me just the meat without any fat. And I like a strip with French fries, but I want a ribeye with a big old baked potato. See, I don't like baked potatoes. Gosh, it just depends on the cut. Sometimes I want a pan-fried steak with French fries, and that's it. Hell yeah. Sometimes that's I'm what I'm like, talking about. Mm-hmm. 
What about doves? You like eating doves? Buy me some dove now. You wrap some dove up in some bacon. That's good stuff. I had fried dove two nights ago. I love dove. I love quail. I love pheasant. I love turkey. Don't care about wild turkey as much. Really, the only thing you get out of that turkey is breast. The legs are too too rubbery. Oh, yeah. But I like all kinds of wild meat, man. I love elk meat. Elk meat's one of my favorite. Axis deer. I mean, I've eaten all kinds of stuff from different parts of the country. Wild goats. I mean, I, all that's good. Goat's just a, a different type of deer. It's just a hoofed animal. There ain't nothing wrong yeah. with a goat. Yeah. Or lamb or any of that stuff. What about processed meat? How do you feel about that? <laughs> you want to let's get started on all that processed, like fish sticks yeah. or something? Or? No, no, no. Like whenever I work for the city, potted meat, or, <laughs> potted meat, like ham and cheese loaf. That's my shit. Wait, that's what I like. Like from the deli. What? <laughs> like ninety nine cent from like yeah. Dollar General. Like South meat, it's right, it's right by South. The South. Yeah. It's in between South and Bologna. I like Bologna. And I still like a potted meat sandwich every now and then. I hadn't had potted meat in years. And I like, you go, okay, so what, my comfort food, when I was in college, and I was only there for a couple of years, but I didn't have a lot of money. I was poor. But I would go, my, my comfort food, even to this day, I would go and I could buy the cheapest package of weenies that they had. I would get the cheapest green English peas that they had. You can probably get four cans for a dollar back in, whatever it was, cheapies. And then I would get a, a, a cheap bag of potatoes. I would do. I would boil the weenies to get the dye out of them because they had that red dye in them. Mm -hmm. And I would uh, boil my peas, and then I would fry me some French fries. And I could eat on that for like three or four days during the week for, for a, like a couple of bucks. And even nowadays, I've upgraded. I like turkey weenies. I like Le Sour Peas. I still like my French fries. So that's still, if when I'm tired and I come home off the road, that is still my comfort food that I fix for myself. See. Isn't that yeah, crazy? That That is. So whenever I work. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that that's that's insane. Like, I, no, I mean, you think about it. You think about it, okay? How, how much? You said all that costs, what, $4? Oh, maybe. I mean, even, even now, four or five bucks. I mean, you could eat on I mean, it. Yeah, it's cheap. What? Yeah, and you think you go to McDonald's now and you get a number one. Oh, that's it's eight, nine dollars. Shit. When's the last time you went to McDonald's? It's been a while. <laughs> don't lie. I don't know. But bears, sometimes because number one, I mean at Whataburger or, or Whataburger. McDonald's or whatever or Wendy's. And it's it's anywhere between nine and eleven bucks, depending yeah. on the store. So it varies a little bit. Well, and like whenever I worked for the city, I would go there was a Dollar General right beside where we worked or where you know, our headquarters was. And I would pack a cooler and I would get all the ice out of our freezer and our refrigerator. I'd dump it in that little cooler and I would go over there. I'd get me a loaf of bread. I would get me a pack of ham and cheese loaf and I would get me a bag of Dollar General chips. Yeah. And there was enough meat in that little 99 cent pack. I could get one piece of ham and cheese loaf. I would alternate it. One week it'd be ham and cheese loaf. One week it'd be bologna. Oh. But I would get I would get one piece, you know, Monday through Thursday, and on Fridays I'd get two pieces of whatever meat it was, and I would literally eat all week, every lunch break for like five bucks. Yeah, I mean you can. Yeah, absolutely. I got to tell this story. It reminds me of something. My grandmother, I loved her so much. I spent all my summers and my holidays with her, and as my career took off and everything, my, my grandmother got Alzheimer's real bad, and she eventually moved in with my aunt and uncle. And my uncle worked at the, at the paper mill, so he would pack his lunch every night and uh, uh, put it in one of those igloo coolers and stick it in the refrigerator. My grandmother would get up and roam around the house in the middle of the night. She had insomnia. Well, she would get up, and she would get the lunch box out, eat all of his lunch, <laughs> and stick the baggies back in the box in the refrigerator, and he'd get to his job and get ready for lunch, open it up, be nothing but empty sacks. I've always <laughs> thought that was so funny. I mean, because she didn't even remember what she was doing half the time. She'd eat all his shit up, boy. Oh, <laughs> I really like the little smokies. I like the little smokies too. Damn yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. You put some sweet baby rays on that little crock pot. That's um, the little puppy peckers. Yeah, right? you, add, yeah. you put some jack or something in puppy there. Puppy peckers. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, that's that's what Derek calls them. That's a that's that's the perfect Super Bowl snack. It is. Well, okay. Oh, so I love them. Just all you need is a box of toothpicks or sticky fingers yeah, in there. Put them in there. Well, we made them one time. I think probably for football. And then I brought the leftovers to work. I had just started a new job. <laughs> when I moved up here, and Nick Hartley still makes fun of me 
from the, for like this day about bringing that for my lunch. He's like, anybody need some little Smokies? <laughs> and I'm like, they're good. They are good. Yeah. Oh, they're great. I love them. My mom does this thing where she does grape jelly and ketchup mixed oh. together. Oh. Yeah, and my wife will actually put the grape jelly in with the barbecue sauce mm-hmm. when she puts them in the crock pot. Damn, it works put so a little, good. Put a little Jack or bourbon or anything in there and cook it in the crock pot. Speaking of bourbon. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh, goodness. Just one more, Lindsay. Just one well, more. no, it's good because our next segment, you're going to need to be loosey-goosey. Oh, yeah, you Loose? need to stretch out. Oh, you need to stretch. I'm I've good. heard you're a high kicker. <laughs> okay. They're trying out for the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. All right. All right. Hey, I can kick pretty high. Yeah, that's what I've seen the video. Oh, you have? Oh, yeah. So uh, You don't even jump up. It's a flat-footed kick. That's right. Yeah. Gravity likes me too much. I can't See jump that. very high. <laughs> oh, God. My piano player usually does the video stuff. He got freaking COVID, so he ain't even going out this weekend. We had to find another oh, piano Lord. player. I'm actually going out playing piano, too. <laughs> Oh, no, no, fuck no. There we go, boys. I don't know how to do anything. Mm, you know how to run the video. Yeah. I'm, hopefully it's working. Uh, pretty good. It works. Oh, and by the way, I would also like to brag on Derek for just a second. Oh, Lord. Now I got to listen to him. No, no, no. <laughs> Tell me so, all about him. Tell us. I, I'm not kidding. You don't hear anybody talking about how great their boss is. That has normal jobs. Derek talks so highly of you at the river all the time. That's no joke. I'm not gassing it. you up or anything. My partner, man. He is. He has talked highly of you since the day I met him. Wow, I appreciate that. Well, what do you, what do you yeah. talk about me? I say you're awesome. You keep, <laughs> you keep his ass in line, and that's that's a full time job. So it takes her and my wife tag, teaming up on me to do that too. I'm telling you what, they communicate behind my back. I know they do. I don't Bull I'll tell you the crap. only I thing know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The, the only thing I, that I have a qualm with about you is these early morning podcasts because I have to get up so early and drive up here. But that's not that bad because it's like you said earlier, when you wake up in the morning, sometimes you just pissed off. I'll take first thing this morning, six thirty, my alarm went off. I let out a loud motherfucker, was it like with the James Hetfield on the end of it. Yeah. And then, I, then I was like, dude, you get to go two, you get to go do two podcasts today. One was with your good buddy. You know, and then you hop on a bus tonight to go travel and play some shows this weekend with Tracy Lawrence. Get your ass up. What is there you going? go. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Okay, we'll do nine o'clock next time. Oh, great. Wait, hold on. So on a serious I'll, I'll note. I'll drive up the night before for that. What what time did you did you say you had to wake up this morning? Six thirty? So I got up at six thirty. If if I have to be here, I always leave the house three hours before that because it takes me like two to get here, but then I count for traffic and then if I need to stop and get gas or whatever. Yeah. Which means if I leave three hours before, I have to be up at least an hour before that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, hey, here's the thing, dude. When I worked for the city, our summer hours, I had to be there and punch the clock at six. Uh, yep. No. So think about that. No. Don't want to. Dude, Don't it, isn't it crazy? <laughs> you could have come out last night and slept on the bus. Yeah, well, I had to. See, I'm you I got have tra- buses are all down there in the yard. I mean, oh. I got all my stuff right here in the yard, man. <laughs> he, he couldn't have crawled in the bed with you? No. <laughs> no. Becca was no. back yeah. to his little noggin. Uh, no, he don't want to stay up here, Tyler. He's scared to death of my wife. I mean, really? She is She's scared. awesome, but I'm so terrified of her. Cause Why? Because if, if she doesn't like me, then I'm gone. Oh, yeah. So she, she's the she queen. Like so I, I think she loves me. But, she does. Yeah. But I've, I've kind of made her like me, just cutting up with all the time. So I think I'm in there. Yeah. <laughs> she still intimidates you. Oh, big yeah, time. she does. Big time. Yeah, she don't let him in the house. <laughs> no, it's all good. The hell, he's got three buses down there, so I can just sleep on yeah. any of them. And I have a truck, so there's four options. Absolutely. Oh, camper, or five. you come up here and sleep in a pool house. Yeah. I'm hell, a- you could sleep yeah. 40 people on them three buses. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Could you imagine 40 people on them three buses? It would not be fun. How many people do you have to a bus? Uh, I think there's seven on the crew bus. There's five on the on the white bus, and just two. My daughter and I on my bus. That is ideal. It's awesome. So it's That's not. Awesome. It's not everybody's over packed on. And the crew bus is a twelve bunker, so they're not loaded up with everybody climbing over the top of each other. Uh, the five people on the white bus, there's six bunks in it and a big lounge in the back. So there's. I mean, everybody's got their own closet and stuff. Yeah. No kidding. You have your own closet? 
I mean, I share it with our lead. But that um, he's he can't ride the white bus because the band leader don't like him. Joe don't like him. <laughs> he acts like he don't. He's actually making eye contact with me now, though, and cracking jokes like that aren't directed at me. He, he's we call him Junior on the road, so that's our love name for him. Yeah, I've junior. heard you call him Junior. But, but Junior, 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 over the last year has really applied himself musically and has really raised his game up and put some time in and worked on his craft a little bit. So Joe appreciates him a little bit more. There, the first couple of years, Joe didn't like you because he thought the only reason you were there is because I liked you. I thought so, too. <laughs> <laughs> I still kind of assume that's why I'm still here. <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> well, but you know what's crazy? Kind of kind of speaking on that, um, Derek, I mean, he's still a, a ma- like top-tier guitar player, okay? He's okay. Well, he, yeah. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I mean – this is this is no joke, and I'm I'm not, you know, trying to change the subject or anything. But without you and without him, this is no shit. I don't know. I mean, you have impacted me in ways you have no idea. Oh Lord! <laughs> I remember. I, this is no shit. I remember walking into the kitchen whenever I was little, and my mom. It was whenever Bluetooth speakers had probably just came around. I was probably ten, twelve years old. My mom would be playing Tracy Lawrence. Or in Gretchen Wilson and stuff like that in the kitchen while she's sitting there frying chicken. And without this guy, this is, I mean, it's just crazy to think that, you know, what was it, two years ago? Two, three, something like yeah, two, two, two and a half years ago, we met at a campfire. And, you know, he's played some of my first shows with me at Puckett's Grocery Store. I know that place, yeah. And, I mean, it's just, I, honestly, this is no joke. I've been looking forward to this podcast for months. That's and, awesome. And then this summer, dude, we, uh, you know, from that riverbank in Perry County, Tennessee, all the way up to Montana, sharing the same stage. And then now we're hanging yeah. out with Tracy Lawrence and his man cave drinking whiskey. What? I know. Surrounded by mannequins and deer heads. This is awesome. <laughs> That mannequin yeah. caught me off guard. It does everybody. Here. It scares the crap out of everybody. I saw. Uh, I My saw, wife thinks it's really funny. I saw your uh, your podcast with uh, Lori Morgan. She's a piece of work, and she yeah. I love her to death. Yeah, yeah she's awesome. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty funny. She. Uh, I did find out some things that last last podcast about Lori that I didn't know. I didn't know she was a klepto, and I didn't know she was a mermaid. What are you talking about? Uh, so Lori, uh, Lori has uh, all this uh, several mermaid outfits that she likes to work out in the pool in, or she'll put these things on where she has a tail. She says it works her core. She's got like several colors. She's got a whole entourage, a, a, a layout of these mermaid tails. And she told me, she said the other thing. She said I'm, I'm klepto. She said I have this bad habit of when I go in people's houses, I'll take something like meaningless just to commemorate this. Like she's a freaking clip to us. I said I need to go back and check my house. What the hell did she take from you? I have no idea. <laughs> Luckily, yeah. we didn't let her in the main house. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! So she just steals something. That's from what she told me. Room? I mean, I, she's told it to me. Real sweet woman, though. Oh, I love her to That's death. Sweet. What the <laughs> hell? I got a thing about mermaids too. And she's still pretty. I don't care what anybody says. She's still gorgeous. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't watch the whole podcast. I'm, I'm gonna have to go back and watch it. Now. <laughs> I mean, like, what? I mean, what kind of stuff does she take? She took a teacup set, yeah. wasn't it? Well, that was at some. Uh, where, where did what? she? She was at something, that was but so, that wasn't like somebody's house. That was something that she, an event she did, and right. she thought that it was part of her gift bag. She just took the whole tea set out of the room or something. Set. All right, yeah. so I have I have a problem with that. How do you? You said something meaningless. That could have been somebody's great grandma China. I know. You know? The I urn know. that she took out of that one house. <laughs> <laughs> she did not oh, take an urn. Shit. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. I love you, Lori. <laughs> we gotta stop taking shots now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so who's the coolest person you met out on the road? I mean, you're starting to kind of get in the mix and meeting people and and uh, kind of knowing all the all the folks around town. Good and bad, if you wanna say. I would say, hmm. I would say some of the coolest people I've met. I, I can't say just one, because I feel like that doesn't do justice. Yeah. To all the great people that I get to meet, I would say cool wise, and this is no shit. I'm not gassing you up here. Like, when people say don't meet your heroes, 
I was really, really nervous to meet you at the Bozeman, Montana airport. And it was like 530 in the morning. I was like, man, just, you know, let let him be. I was talking to Derek. I was like, just let him be. Like, I'll, I'll meet him when we land or whatever. And he was like, no, come on. So he took me over there to meet you. And that was that that was where I was like, okay, that saying is bullshit. Okay. Because I grew up listening to you. And I, quite honestly, I still can't believe that I'm sitting at your house right now doing this podcast. But I would say, no doubt, Tracy Lawrence, uh, Nate Smith is the nicest guy you will ever meet in your life. He's a, you know, a newcomer. Yep. He just had a number one, just coming off number one. Um, Man, I would say Randy Hauser is another really good one. Oh, Randy yeah. Hauser is one of the nicest guys you'll meet. Funny as hell. Yes, and Justin Moore. That's that's a few I'm throwing out there. That's you. all good ones, man. Yeah, Absolutely. Justin, uh, I, I have a show coming up with Justin, uh, I think, in October, I think it is, in Missouri, uh, that I'm really looking forward to. We got to share the main stage at uh, Gulf Coast Jam, so that was a lot of fun, and I actually got to bring my parents out on stage during that show and kind of thank them for everything. Is that down at the floor of Bama? Oh, it's it's that, in, that's uh, the one in Pensacola, isn't it? It's at Gulf, uh, no, it's at uh, Panama City. Panama City. That used to be, uh, I think that thing used to be a, up a little bit further in Alabama. No, that's the hangout you're thinking of, I believe. Mm. But you played yeah, the, that is. I played Pensacola. the Gulf Coast yeah, Gym once or other. twice. Yeah. 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 Mitchell Tenpenny was on it the year you played. Yeah, yeah. Dude, I love that picture right there. When you get your parents out there. Oh, they, yeah. They're some of the sweetest people on this planet. I ain't saying that just to gas you up. I mean, they really, really are. And you can tell they did a hell of a job parenting just by the way you carry yourself. Oh, so. thank you. Yeah. you. Your mama looks like somebody you don't want to mess with. So my mom is the sweetest lady in the you world. You push her too hard. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So the whole time growing up, uh, we you were at the beginning, you were talking about child services and stuff. <laughs> like, I mean, I was so scared to get a whipping from my mama. But my dad, he would just play like, you know, scream so your mom thinks I'm whipping you. We'd be around the corner, you know. <laughs> and so, like, he'd smack his belt, and I'd be like, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom, she would get a hold of me, and it was like World War Three is going on. Like, bam, did that hurt? You know, and dumbass me i'm like no that didn't even hurt and wham do another one i mean it was yeah but uh yeah my my mama she's a sweet lady like you said unless you cross her it's and, way my then it's scary yep. then it's scary Hell yeah. so you've got a handful of things left to do this year a couple a couple more months and you're winding down uh any tours set for next year are you going out with anybody what's going on with we're kind of we're we're talking to several people um trying to get something in the works yep a lot more radio stuff to do yep there's, there's some more radio stuff to do that's not updated uh probably <laughs> but you got a country thunder on there dude that's huge and then we're doing the Pensacola interstate fair there yeah, you are. So you're there. Uh, I actually looked at that because oh, cool. I wanted to stay and watch y'all show. I think it's the next night y'all are there, or maybe the night before. It's we're one day apart though. Uh, but uh, when you're in Jonesboro, Arkansas, Jonesboro, tell everybody I said hello. I got a lot of relatives in Marianne, all in that area. You really? I do. So Jonesboro, uh, whenever that show kind of got brought to me. I was like, man, that's I've killed a lot of ducks in Jonesboro. Oh, man, that's that dad that, guard all that down through there, all that farmland off the river, man. That's lots and lots of ducks down there. It's a lot of ducks. Yeah. A lot of ducks. I'm gonna have to have to readdress the duck hunting situation. I got too many people trying to make me duck hunt. Hey, I just don't like being cold. So I'm getting to go on a on a guided duck hunt this year. You're more than welcome to come. It'll be. I'll make sure there's heat there. <laughs> I'll make sure there's heat there. Well, and here's the thing. So. When people think about duck hunting, they think about, oh, hell, I got to get waders and all this. Not necessarily. Depends on where you're going. Yeah. Well, I love hunting blinds. So a blind, I put my I put my little fuzzy pants on, fuzzy camo pants. I'll put my little short muck boots on. I'll put on a thick jacket. I grab my shotgun, hop in the boat and go. And then you just step out of the boat into the blind you have a kitchen, you have a TV, you have everything. Well, that's my kind of dang hunting right there. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, dude, so 
we knew somebody that had bought an old school bus that was going to renovate it. So we got all of those little bench seats out of that school bus, and it's lined around the whole blind. Oh, I'll be done. So if you want to lay down and take a nap, you can lay down and take a nap on a school bus seat. That's nice, man. Yeah. So, yeah, everybody I knew back home would go out and wade through the water and all that. That's cold out there, especially yeah. in, like, February and March. That's I'm cold. Not, yeah, I'm not going to bust ice and cut through ice. No. That, you know, no. If, don't get me wrong. I have before. I have plenty of times. But I had some buddies this past year. They brought a chainsaw to cut through two feet of ice to duck hunt. And I'm like, man, as cool as that sounds – I think I would rather sit at home and watch Christmas movies or something like that. You know, Hallmark Channel. <laughs> exactly. Well, when watch you those. Do that, come to my house, and you can usually start about July and watch them with my wife. <laughs> 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 yeah, they start showing Christmas movies in July. At my I house. didn't know that. Oh yeah, I didn't know that. It's not Isn't awesome. that great? It's not. <laughs> it is not. I hate it. I hate hey, do everything. you have fish in this pond down here? I did. I had it loaded up with catfish and, and sun perch, and I'd put some crappie in it. Uh, I have a big runoff creek that's behind my pond, and all my catfish started disappearing because I had a big food tub. I'd go down there and put food out and stuff, and the catfish would just come up to the food when right. I'd throw it out. And then about two years ago, everything started going away. I wouldn't see any I had a freshwater otter that got in my pond and decimated my catfish population. I hadn't seen any crappie. I hadn't seen any catfish. And I, I didn't put bass in it. But I'm in the process of renovating that. I did a bunch of rock work around it. I'm getting ready to put an aeration system in it. And then I'm going to put some largemouth bass and restock after the first yeah. of the year. When we get into the spring, after I get the pond stable, i got to get some oxygen down deep. But I've got it set up for crappie beds. Uh, when I dug the pond in, I just I don't have any predatory fish in. I, and I'm overrun with sunfish right now. So I've got to get some balance work done. What kind of crappie are you going to put in there, you know? Probably a big old slab black crappie. That's that's the what black, I like. The black, black crappie is what I like. So they get big. Yeah, those white crappie though, they reproduce so much, and I think that uh, I think that those white crappie, like if you put those in a little pond, then they just overrun everything and like. Attention. Yeah, and and you and I'm having the same problems with the uh, sunfish. But sunfish, I, I bet I've got some sunfish in there that are slabbed up like that that are ginormous. But I've got to get, I've got to establish the bass right now. Yeah. I think that's the next thing because yeah. I've got a food source established for them. So I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting there. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting. I love there. fishing. I do too, man. I grew up doing it. Grew up hunting, fishing, doing all that stuff. What do you, so. What do you think the best eating fish is? Crappie to me. Yeah. And and I love catfish too. As long as it's a lot of mud cat, like like a channel cat, a blue cat, I like I like those catfish. You know who Hannah Barron is? Oh, yeah. We should go do some catfishing with Hannah Barron sometime. What do you think, Junior? You know I've never noodled before. So I, I noodle throw, her. We throw this out to Hannah Barron. We, Hannah Barron needs to come do my podcast, don't you think? I think she does. I think she does. And then well, she needs to teach me how to go catch a catfish with my hand. Yes. yes. And if she doesn't, I'll take you. Okay. Because we've done that before. <laughs> So, <laughs> I would, hey, I wouldn't mind going with Hannah. We should all go with Hannah. That's it. I'm calling her. Calling her right now. She lives in Alabama. She ain't that far. Yeah. <laughs> She's not that far. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so you got Fresno, uh, September 23rd, Jonesboro. What, that's, uh, uh, Fresno the 28th of September, Jonesboro the 30th, South Greenfield, Missouri on the 7th of October, Nashville, Tennessee at the Grand Ole Opry on the 11th of October. Semi Florida, know it well, October the 20th, Pensacola on the 19th, and I guess we'll be there on the 30th, and November the 24th in Indianapolis, eight yes, seconds saloon. Well, we played them all. We, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, everything's winding down this time of year, but uh, I'm actually getting to write. You know, you said earlier you only write at a certain time of year. Yep. I'm getting to write, you know, right about now. I'm actually writing tomorrow with some of my favorite guys, and, um, I feel like, you know, when you do get to write, when you haven't for, you know, quite a while, when you do get to write, it's like, man, this is, I've missed this. But yeah. you don't want to get, you don't want to get too used to it. And then, you know, you, you might not want to go back out on the road or whatever it may be. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've been writing a lot in the last several weeks. And I actually wrote one um, here a couple of weeks ago that hopefully we cut. It's called Penny to My Name. And the hook is, I made million-dollar memories when I didn't have a penny to my name. And that, 
I mean, that song right there, it just melts me. That's awesome. So, anything else, brother? Man, I just got to say how proud I am of you to 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 admit you're on the riverbank, to having you sit here right now, man. It's just it's so awesome to watch your journey. Then I finally got to see you with your band up there in Montana. His band is awesome. The three piece plus you. Yeah, yeah, so, it's a three. We don't run any tracks or anything. No, so. good tracks. for you. It's, uh, uh, I don't think y'all. We don't run no tracks. Yeah, I, I didn't think you. We're did. a band, man. Female drummer, dude. She is badass. Yeah, she's awesome. She's I'm, good. I'm, I'm really. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thank you. I just uh, want to say how proud I am of you. And I'm glad you finally got to do the Opry. I watched the live stream on your on your mom's uh, feed there. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's so cool to have you up here. I love it. Dude, I'm tickled to be here. Honestly. Seriously. Thank you very much. Very good. Been a pleasure having you, my friend. Thank you. Mr. Shane Private. Yeah, baby.